everyone. Um, nice to be in Miami. Um, the first hour is very nice. It's my first time in Miami. It's my first hour in Miami, ever. Yeah, yeah, so here we are. Um, and it's, so thank you for the uh, welcome carpet. Um, it's great to see you guys. Um, we're gonna have a conversation under the subject. Are we ready? Is everybody good? Everybody's comfortable? Um, what we're talking about is, is culture in the Americas in big trouble? Um, that's Anne Pasternak, and uh, she's director of the Brooklyn Museum. <laughs> After doing amazing work at Creative Time. Thank you. Yeah, so. Um, this is Bill Arning, who's uh, director of the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston. <laughs> After doing amazing work at MIT. And uh, this is Jordan Castile, uh, one of our best painters. It's amazing. Painting is still alive. Yes. And because it's alive, we have better and worse painters. And she's one of the better ones. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> um, after doing amazing work at the Yale Art Program, she's newly sprung from the head of Zeus um, and fully formed. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know, I started doing this thing where I talk about how people are younger than I am. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's like a thing that happens to you, yeah. That's why um, I'm next to you. That's yeah. Me. So I think we're just gonna dive into it um, because what happens when you have a sort of large rubric of this kind is that, um, I like saying that there's no such thing as a stupid question, right? Because what it can be is it's a door into other things. I mean, there are stupid questions, but it can be an opportunity to think about things in a bigger way. So we have this loose, somewhat ambiguous um, inquiry. Is culture in the Americas in big trouble? Um, so we'll just do the yes or no answer, and then we can break for drinks. <laughs> and? Yes. Yes. Bill? Oh, yeah, it's... Uh... One word. Yes. <laughs> Jordan? I just don't know what that means. Right, <laughs> right. So I don't know, how... yes. Right. You can tell who's really recently come out of a grad program. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a complicated question, yeah. but there can also be a yes or no answer to it in a way. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Could we start with you? Could you, when you saw this title, what were some of the things you, you began to think about? Um, I thought about a lot of things initially. The first being, how do we, who's defining culture? Um, and what does culture prescribe? in different contexts. So for me, it was like, is it culture in the Americas is so vast as an idea, as an experience, as a lived experience. Um, I just didn't know where to begin. What did you make of the Americas, plural? The Americas. What do you think that was about? I think talks about this place and being here at Basel and the representations of works in the Americas. Um, but that's also layered for me. This is the, now I mean, I'm, I'm conscious of my grad school brain. But. Did you hear it as the USA is in multiplicate, it's layered? Or did you hear it as everything from like Chile to yeah, Canada? Totally. Yeah. That's what you heard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What did you hear? That's what I heard, but I wasn't sure why. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what what is unique about the situation of the Americas that does not extend laterally. Mm -hmm. um, well, having moved to uh, Texas in 2009, and Texas does, under, after living in the Northeast for my entire life, Texas does understand itself as another country, uh, mm -hmm. and that they teach Texas art history and Texas political history as a separate class. And then I get there, and I have all the assumptions about what Texas is that one has when one 
lives your entire life in New York and Boston, as I had. And then I'm like, okay, this is very different. It's actually um, libertarian at its crux mm -hmm. in that it's got this, idea, this sort of distrust of government and this thing that has now, in the larger culture, turned into this um, strange uh, neoconservative. But there, there's this idea that the government's not supposed to be doing things. So right. there's this weird free spirit that actually has been very progressive for the arts. Um, it's a, so when I, when I saw the topic, is it in big, big trouble, it was about, to me, the echo chamber of culture. That if you spend all your time seeing movies, reading books, listening to music, and seeing exhibitions that already reinforce what you think you know about the culture, that is the sort of echo chamber that Facebook is. And that is the, is the real risk is that because of the polarization of the culture, we don't want to see anything we don't already agree with. And I think that is where the trouble is. Um, and I, I know, I mean, I, I plead guilty. I, I want to see my personal passions reflected. I want to see the things that make me politically angry reflected. And do I want to see other posi positions that disagree with me? No. And how do we get out of that double bind? So for you, the crux is insufficient diversity of our personal experiences? No, it's, it's like... Are we, we not, siloed off? Or? Well, it, it, one of the things that I was on a panel recently, the demographics of who doesn't take advantage in culture in their cities, people who assume cultures for other people, mm. um, is very nearly one-on-one -on -one with the people that continue to support Trump despite everything. And so I was with a group of museum people and we asked ourselves, well, if this 28% is not moving and they also are not interested in culture, they're not interested in museums, do we just write them off? Is that what, you know, are we comfortable as a museum writing off 28% of the population that continues to think this is what's supposed to be happening? Do you think part of, I'm gonna push you a little bit. Yeah. Do you think part of the problem could be the idea that culture is institutional? Oh, yeah. And in, in, in other words, there's nobody who doesn't have culture, who doesn't engage with culture. So is, is part of our problem def definitional here, that all those folks who are not showing up at the museum are engaging in culture? Yeah. Um, the definitions of what people think of as culture is really fascinating. Um, uh, if you, when, when they do polls, um, eating ethnic food, going to a, um, a beer festival, when people, uh, uh, most Americans consider that to be a cultural activity, yeah. which is so, yes, there is culture that they think about, you know, anything to do with high culture. Um, in a lot, of the, a lot of our cities, like Houston is a giant fried egg of a city. There, yeah. The city goes on for, you're, you're in your car for an hour and you're still in Houston. And people don't, who choose to live on the outside of that egg, um, don't ever take advantage of what's offered for free in the city. Right. So it's kind of an institutional responsibility as well, right? We, um, I, we keep <laughs> looking at the groups that do it well. Um, the, in Houston, the one that does it best is this group called Opera To Go. Because if you, you can put an opera singer on a bus and take them to any school within an hour, and when you see that sound come out of a human body, it changes something. It changes you. something. So the kids are like, and you know, only one out of 20 is ever gonna like, go like, oh, I wanna get you go into the city to do it. But that works well. We, um, for, for us, the best thing we can do is when we get extra funding to have an artist stay longer and go meet with uh, junior high and high school students in the, in the suburbs, that makes a difference. Uh, that mm. helps get, it, get, you know, get out into people whose parents may have decided 20 years before they hate museums, mm -hmm. but if a kid meets a natural artist who's like, I've got a painting show at the CAM now, do you want to come see it? They will come. Well, that opens up a number of different yeah. uh, furrows, um, but I'm gonna let uh, Anne jump in here, and what's, for you, what's the, institu what's the relationship between culture, that word, that, you know, the word that makes us reach for the gun, um, and, and institutions? Well, I just first want to say one of the reasons why I wanted to do this panel was one, because Mary asked me, two, because you were moderating and I'd be on the panel with these dear, wonderful, extraordinary human beings, and three, because of the title. The fact that 
Art Basel said Americas mm. as opposed to America or the United States mm. symbolized to me a cultural shift, a very positive one, mm -hmm. that we're recognizing a greater pl plur plurality of cultures yeah. than just our own. Um, and interestingly, Art Basel as a fair, as a business, has always been more global on the cutting edge than museums in New York City, for example, or throughout the rest of the United States. Um, you know, you could go to Art Basel almost 15 years ago and say, oh, that looks like a Solowit, and then you realize it's an artist from Guatemala, and there's a gallery in Guatemala, and this was being made in the 1960s, and you had no idea, right? right? So it is interesting how global capital has had some benefits to our understanding of, um, in this context, the Americas, or more significantly, cultures, and our similarities and our differences. So I, I was excited by the title. I thought it's, it, it um, highlighted with intention, I'm assuming, um, you know, a, a more inclusive worldview than we would have had probably even three or five years ago. Right, but that immediately leads me to ask, because your answer to the initial question was yes. Okay, so, so were why, you thinking of the United States? So when I'm saying culture, you're thinking art world and institutions, I'm not. Okay. I'm thinking of what's happening. There's a war on culture in this. Let's focus on the United States for a oh, second. So that's my question. There is so you're a thinking war about the US. On culture. Yeah. There is a war on people of color. There's a war on immigrants. There's a war on women. I am really concerned about culture in this country. Now, the good news is sitting in this chair first thing this morning was God, also known as Brian Stevenson. And Brian said that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Oh. So I'm trying to tap into hopefulness. Mm. But I'm worried. Amen to that. Amen yeah. to that. Yeah. Do you, are you worried about culture in Mexico or in Brazil? You know, I'm not an, I don't live in those places, so I'm not an expert in those places. I mean, I think that in terms of artistic practice, people are feeling energized and productive in their practices, whether it's music, or visual art, or design, or internet, whatever they're doing um, on a community level or on an international level, I think people are feeling in energized to be responsive to the moment uh, and starting to stand up to this historic call, right? So I think artistic practice, other than the struggles of artists, is alive and well. I am concerned about, um, in the United States, the tax plan. I, I mean, yeah, no, how, was, like a, how was your week? It's, yeah, it's like, you know, it's, it's like a tsunami, and I don't even know how to plan for it. And there are yeah. days, frankly, where you say, is this the best I can do for the world? You know, running a museum and supporting artists, and I want the answer to be that, yes, that is very meaningful, but it is a tsunami, and I want it to be as powerful as it possibly can, because, you know, I, I, I joke, but it's not a joke, that Art Basel feels like the party before the apocalypse right now. And I'm, I'm sure I'm being, well, I'm not so sure that I'm being overly dramatic. No, you're not. I, I, I've just been thinking to myself that this is a week in which you could sort of talk about seven different things that have happened this week, all of which are unbearable. And here we are, we're bearing it somehow. Yeah. I have a very pointed question for you, Jordan. Um, if, we, if we talk about this current moment being fraught in some way, being intense in some way, I mean, I, mean, I think if you say, well, this current moment is really intense, I wondered from your point of view, how do you frame that current moment? Where does it begin for you? So to call it a moment, where does it start for you? Does it start in November 2016? Does it start in the summer of 2014 with Ferguson? It starts with my family. I think it starts at home in my observations of my community starting at the time that I was at least cognizant enough of what was happening with the world around me. I think the trickle effect and the way that media and art and all these platforms have um, exemplified, I mean, granted, we're in more state of terror than maybe previously, <laughs> like things are particularly bad, yeah. but in my opinion, shit's been bad for a while. Right. And, excuse me, um, and as a result, oh, no, we'll oh, okay, get good. I was like, we'll, we'll get saltier than but that. I feel like it's been bad it's right. for a yeah, while yeah, in yeah. a lot of ways, and um, things are 
coming to awareness for a lot of people for the first time or are starting to go into depths of their thinking, that yeah. they're understanding that being liberal isn't enough, that mm. there's work to be done mm. and an interpersonal, and it starts with our communities, the people that we engage with every day. So for you, this is really, the moment we're talking about is an intensification. It's oh, not totally. as if something is just starting. It's the snowball that has Do been Do you find building. that you're having to be in conversation with a lot of people for whom this is something that's just starting? Yes and no. I think I'm a baby on this panel. I recognize that. But even in my um, maturing in the past few years, my circles have become smaller and smaller and more distilled. And so I feel like the people that I'm most frequently surrounded by are in a place similar to myself. Yeah. Um, and then there are opportunities, depending on what side of the table I'm feeling on, because some days I don't feel like being like, this has been happening. Where have you been? Mm -hmm. um, that people just need to talk this through right now and engage. I was talking to a nice liberal last week who said, <laughs> um, who said, I know he's a very bad person, but we don't actually have evidence that he's racist against black people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I thought, yeah, mm -hmm. I know that's what you think. Yeah. And it's amazing that there are people who think that yeah. because the people who will go all the way to the apocalypse still looking for him to maybe say the N-word mm -hmm. as evidence that he's racist. One of the things, I, I just went over, my friends curated the last Istanbul biennial, so I went to Istanbul in September. And I, um, the political situation there makes ours look Rosie. temporary, yeah. because they actually, their president has actually changed the constitution so he's president forever. Yeah. And I'm there, and I'm meeting with Turkish artists and friends, and I realize, when I was talking to them, how hopeful all my friends still are here, because people are still organizing and doing things. And there is this sense underneath it all that the political world will rewrite itself at some point, and that this is gonna be a temporary aberration. We will still look back on the Obama years the way my parents look back on the Kennedy years as like the, the wonderful period, but that some things will get better. And when I was talking to my Turkish artist friends and they were like, no, we have to get out of here. The only thing that's gonna get better is if there's a violent revolution. And I'm like, so I came back going, I know nobody wants to hear that here, but you're actually where we all behave daily, having hope because we're still organizing and doing things. And I, and, and I, I was unaware of how hopeful we were until I saw a place that was actually hopeless. This is very interesting, Bill, yeah. So um, I was just gonna say, Jordan, you know, I know, th I, I have a sense, I always say that my whole adult life is about peeling back the layers of my social conditioning. So I do have a sensitivity and um, I, I hope and an understanding of things have always been bad. It's just much clearer how bad they are. Um, so I, I respect that. And um, at the same time, I think that this is s so monumental what's about to happen to middle class and poor people in this country. Um, and you know, the, the, it's holding up a mirror of our darkest side of who we are as a nation. And how do we compete with all these policy changes? You know, I hope that taking to the streets really matters and we must do it. Mm. We must use all of our creativity to fight injustice. I love when artists think about their practice as legislative art and working to change policy or whatever it may be. Um, but these, this is, it, it feels to me to be a very extreme moment in our history, and it is, it is concerning. I mean, we're gonna take this title and maybe disassemble it like a, like a watch, because I wanna think about what big trouble means. Um, there's somebody, there's, I'm always forgetting who said this thing. Uh, the idea that the future is here, but it's just not evenly distributed. Was it William Gibson? Okay, so William Gibson, the future is here already, just not ev evenly distributed. I feel like the apocalypse is here already, but it's not evenly distributed. Right. So when, I, when you talk to folks in Turkey, and yeah. I went to Turkey this year as well, yeah, it's grim. Yeah. Pretty evenly distributed there, horrible. But I think there are people in this country for whom the apocalypse has arrived already. Yeah. Um, I feel sufficiently adjacent to that, even with all my privilege, 
that I seriously think is our future here. Um, it, it has become so toxic and, and hateful. So, and I think this is a helpful idea for us to sort of think about that our condition has never been unitary, yeah. and especially now it cannot be. There are people whose doors are being kicked down right now. Right. You know, you've heard about people who are being picked up by ICE because yeah. reporters reported about them being undocumented. I mean, there's persecution going on right now. How about here in Florida where people were told ICE is not, is gonna stop during the hurricane evacuation, but they didn't stop for four days. Right. So people were promised on the media that, and by the government that it would be safe, and in fact it wasn't safe. One of the books I had a run-in with had nothing to do with contemporary politics, uh, but it, in, in grad school was called The Formation of a Persecuting Society. It was actually about medieval Europe and about the rise of anti-Semitism, um, but it was very methodical, you know, old school social history about how different communities just started being cruel and telling untrue stories. Um, but I f often think of, of that, the title of the book a lot, The Formation of a Persecuting Society. How do societies begin to persecute minorities within them? Um, I think we're forming, we've already had, but we're ramping up the persecuting society very much. Um, but I'm, I want to stare this back to, to Art and say, is part of the hope we're talking about also the understanding that in dire times, art that goes beyond the decorative, art that goes beyond being just a consolation to the rich, begins to happen because people have to go down into the dark place and bring something out. Do you guys ever think about that? Maybe I'll start with you, Jordan. For you, do you, th do you see the, the tension and energy of, of being in a dark place potentially affecting the art you make in the next little while? I, I, it comes back to what I sort of said before, too, for me, that the work is, is rooted in the same thing it was rooted five years ago. Now, granted, again, I'm, I'm young in this journey, so ask me in 20 years where the work has gone and whether I look back on this moment as holding an energy that is feeling the turbulence of now, maybe, you know what I mean? Well, your work has never been about entertainment or decoration. No, it's I, always it's, been well, about yeah, marginality I, in those spaces. And it's always been about creating visibility. And oftentimes it started with myself and feeling invisible in spaces and then recognizing that I wasn't alone in that and that trickle effect of recognizing that there are people um, that I probably engage with every day, but I don't take the time to really investigate and get to know that the story of somebody's truth actually requires time. And painting is an opportunity for people to take the time to engage. That there's a slowing down that happens through that really um, tangible, like, material are you, object. Are you throwing shade on photographers? No, not at all. <laughs> I love painting. I mean, granted, I take pictures to make yeah, my painting. I know, so. I know. But I, know. I, I do think there's any way of slowing down. It could be any form. Abs you know, painting is my language. Absolutely. But. I remember Re Rebecca Solnit saying, anything that helps you slow down yeah. is actually good. Taking a walk. Yeah. If writing by hand is what gets you there, but anything that helps you slow down is good. So, do you feel any hesitation or any sort of guilt at all, understanding that the remarkable power of your work actually does come from pain? Do I, do I yeah. feel guilt? Yeah, or do you feel any kind of self-questioning about it, or how do you negotiate it in your head? I just feel heavy all the time. Mm. I think what I, I feel a responsibility, not only to the way that I walk through the world, but the way that I am showing someone else in the way that they move through the world to others. That I become a liaison between relationships and whether or not I'm the keeper of their story or not is completely untrue. I am not the keeper of their story. Right. I'm the entry point of opening a door to slow someone down enough to ask the questions to want to engage further. Yeah, um, I mean, but this is, precisely what every artist we admire yeah. would say, the feeling of being a conduit. Totally. You're not making the work, the work is passing through you on its way to where it needs to be. Yeah. 
So that's, and that's a heavy um, load. But yeah. all of us feel that through whatever our engagement is, whether it's a maker in the physical form or it's a maker in ideas, it's a maker of writing, whatever it is. Yeah. Absolutely. My experience of this past year has been feeling like a barometer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and just sort of feeling this pressure and registering it in various ways. Yeah. One of the things, when I see your work, I always think about fragile communities and preserving their depiction over time. And I, uh, we had the Barclay Hendricks retrospective at the museum, and I looked at the people who were in New London, who he painted, and then also when I think about like you Steers, who died of AIDS early on, who painted people on their, in hospitals and beds, and how like the poetry of those earlier times gets preserved, and when you see those paintings 20 years later. So when I, when I saw the, the last show at the gallery, I was thinking like, I wonder how this is gonna look when the, when the person may not be, be findable anymore, but that, that this painting exists in a sort of permanent record of a dark time. And in a way, this is part of the advantage of realism or realism adjacent practices, mimesis of any kind, yeah. because pure abstraction has a way of, not, not, not completely timeless, but it can be unmoored from its time. Yeah. Uh, and meanwhile, um, yeah, cause, cause my there, there, there are choices in what they're wearing, work, yeah. and, and also just the, the, the street facades that are so specific to 2016, 17. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it becomes a kind of rescue. I would love to have like a whole conversation with you about realism. A lot of people are painting in a sort of realism adjacent yeah. sort of way. I think it's exciting. I think it's problematic. I think for worse painters, it becomes like a stand-in for politics. Look, I painted a black person. No, I don't care, you know? <laughs> because there's more work than that to be done. Um, but I want to sort of move forward and ask Anne and then Bill after to weigh in on this. But let's talk about uh, money and culture and the aspect of the trouble that has to do with money. Where, where does it pinch? Oh, it pinches what's, all the what's, time. What's, um, what's, I, what's, I actually, what what I want, is changing? Okay, so um, I don't know. But what I want to say is the thing that concerns me more, and you might argue with me that I'm wrong to think that this is more a concern, is that you know we turn in on ourselves and we fight one another. Rather than having civil discourse, there's a, a lot of very understandable anger within our own community. And Tell me what you mean by our community. Our, well, in the, art, in the visual arts. I, I run a visual arts museum, and in the visual arts, there's been a lot of understandable appropriate, perhaps, anger towards our institutions and towards one another. People are saying, I'm not having it anymore. You fucked up this world. You fucked up, you know, you, you've been a part of this exclusionary mechanisms, et cetera, the machinery, et cetera, et cetera. And that's very real. But I'm concerned that at this time period with a kind of social media mob mentality, that it's hard to have thoughtful conversations to support one another in change at a time period where we need to come together and we need to be a part of the change we want to see. So you're talking all. about sniping amongst people who are generally left identified. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that we have to be a part of a larger movement. You have the anger management, you hosted that museum. Can you yeah. talk a little, little bit about that? Um, why? Well, just because I, because, <laughs> I loved watching the online presence of it and thinking like all these marvelous artists were dealing with their own anger issues in the public forum hosted at the Brooklyn Museum. I, it's not that I don't want to talk about it, but I'd rather mm -hmm. talk about yeah. the fact that we collaborated with Equal Justice Initiative yeah. and in five weeks turned around an exhibition called Legacy of Lynching, Racial right. Terror in America, right? Yeah. And that when I said to my team that we were gonna collaborate and my team is very diverse, we have inclusive processes, they're really awesome. And when I said we're gonna do this, you know, for a big institution to turn around a show in five weeks of such serious importance was of course alarming. But I said to them, listen, in 1928, I think, the then director of the Brooklyn Museum, my dates will be wrong, but it was close enough, um, wrote a very public letter calling for an end to lynching. In 1963, again, my dates are wrong, but it's close enough. Um, James Baldwin and, and um, uh, um, Bernstein, what's the... Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein. 
I really, it's the bewitching hour for me. I apologize. Leonard Bernstein collaborated on an exhibition calling for an end to lynching and doing a fundraiser with artists at the museum, right? The headlines in the paper, a thousand people came to the museum. Anyway, so <laughs> I'm like, that's a bad day. Uh, but um, uh, it shows you how much has changed, actually. I said, if, we, if they could do that, so long ago. So for you, that's we a moment should, of hope. Should, when it's a moment of hope. It's, we have to participate. We have to try. And we were very scared that in fi with five weeks' time, we were going to screw it up, right? It's too important of an issue to screw up, but it was too important not to participate. And that show opened a few weeks before, you know, the, the, the riots and um, actions, the white supremacist uh, uh, parade in Charlottesville. Um, you know, the timing felt... It was always a, 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 an important time, but it felt very important to this moment in particular, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, but, but Anne, and, um, and I, I, yeah, totally, I totally hear this, yeah. and, I, you know, and I agree with the necessity of it, but I'm also wondering, uh, there's a Nigerian friend of mine speaking about the Nigerian context who says, you know, white people are sort of asking her not to criticize the government so, so much. She says, you know... No, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I do think that we have to be a part of a movement right oh, now. Hold on, hold on. Right? Oh, go ahead. The, the, she says, the house is on fire, don't tell me how to scream. Mm -hmm. So what I want to offer it's is, what, is the po what are the possibilities for, for screaming, for not getting along, for feeling a kind of uncivil urgency? Right. Right? Um, because... I think that's beautifully said. I, I mean, yeah. I'm a very civilized guy, too. I love civility, and I think, you know, I don't like trouble. I don't like people yelling at each other. But I also feel that there are ways in which people have been kept out so much. Of course. That, that I mean, imagine. And I, and I don't disagree with imagine that. Imagine if I wasn't a man of peace. And somebody, some white liberal said to me, well, but is there really evidence that he's racist? I know he's a misogynist, and I know he's crazy, but he actually seems to be fine with black people. And I, and I think, after all you've seen... Yeah, I, I, is, I can't respond to that. That's just ignorance. Now, for example, right. if somebody says that, and then somebody right. else decides to, like, you know, burn everything, would you blame them? I mean... No, no, of course I don't blame them. What I guess I'm saying is that we should, um, in addition to expressing with one another are holding one another more accountable. I think that we also need to join forces and be a part of the creative change that we need to see. Yeah. I, w I wonder that if we get too divided. We're not there yet, but I, I worry about it. I have to say, representing an institution, I want us, maybe it's Pollyannish of me, I want us to be able to also build bridges and with one another work together and help create the change that we must see. Bill? Unity or disunity? Because um, I'm for disunity and she seems to be a fan of I, I mean, I, Well, it's easy for me to be yeah. for unity. I um, get it. I, I went to Quaker school. Uh, I started my entire like junior high school sitting in silence in these sort of, uh, uh, and doing civil, uh, learning civil disobedience as a, as a school class. Uh, so I- uh, Did you say you went to what to, to Quaker school. Quaker, that's to, what I heard. The yeah. Friend Summary yeah, on 16th sure. Street. So like, I had this um, really marvelous upbringing of like bring people together, create um, senses of community from the inside, and I um, and that's how. And also, li living in Houston is really interesting because it's in the middle of one of the most um, conservative states in the country, but then it's marvelously together and the politics there are fascinating because it's not what I thought Texas was going to be um, and just seeing the way communities work together there is kind of amazing uh, when I moved there I, mean, I moved there from Cambridge Mass and people were like aren't you afraid to go to Texas they have guns there and I'm like I still find the fact that people have guns weird but I um, I moved down there and Six weeks after moving there, we, for a, a major American city, we had the only out lesbian mayor in America was Houston for six years. And I'm like, and everyone got along. And I'm like, so I'm so in a very interesting place. I'm for <laughs> unity, yes. I'm for unity because I see it work r relatively well where I'm living now. Does it have to be either or? 
I mean, that's also worth thinking about. Um, Unity? <laughs> Jordan? <laughs> No, I'm struggling across the board right now in a lot of ways, <laughs> yeah. and I'm processing and trying to gather the words and the experiences and the feelings that I'm having in the context of this conversation, um, because it's really hard for me to take the privilege of the art world mm -hmm. out yeah. of um, and how exclusionary that. So the idea of culture, I'm st I just keep coming back to like whose culture are we talking mm -hmm. about right. and who's in trouble? Mm -hmm. And again, I've. Um, I have sensed and felt and seen, and we were talking about, it's hard for me not to think about history and the apocalypse that my people have been persecuted time and time. You know, like those are things right. that I'm like, that pain is so deep within me. To think of unity is, as the right answer for everyone, I don't think is right. completely, I mean, I, as a person, am very loving and generous and wanting like, like a militant me. mediator, yeah. uh, you know? Like yeah. I would love to have the conversation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I agree. And I know that I need space that is separate from you to heal. So Because absolutely, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Because I mean, for me, one of the hardest things to have heard in, the, in, these past, in this past year, in these past many years, is that phrase, oh, but we all want the same thing. And I'm like, you know, we who? Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you know about me? What do you know about what I want? Um, but I know what they mean by it. We want the same vaguely leftish things. But that's not necessarily what I want. That's, or that's not a, sufficient, a big enough side. So I, I mean, I, and I, I, I appreciate the, uh, the difficulty of putting things to words in this, because to, to, speak, uh, uh, to speak about something is to actually risk speaking glibly about it, mm. and to think that words can somehow solve it, but we also kind of have to keep the wound visible, I feel, so. Um, but is the opposite of unity then a sort of siloization, where different um, bubbles form and sort of develop their own interior logics? Well, I think that's a framing. I think to call it a silo is a, is a framing, yeah. you know, because that's, that's an idea we've heard a lot around Trump's voters and like, oh, if only we had talked to them and held their hands, you know, they would not vote for a maniac. Um, but who's holding our hands? Yeah. That's right. You know what I mean? So, you know, some folks out there had it hard they, they've not had it the hardest. That's right. You know, for example, poor black people in America are poorer than poor white people in America. Yeah. You know, but you know. And black women in particular. Right, and there weren't that many long form feature pieces winning Pulitzer Prizes about them as communities. You know, why they upset. So, um, so I wouldn't think it of silos and I would just think about it as maybe the right to opacity, the right to not be united strategically at yeah. moments and then, and, then be, and then be united, you know. Unfortunately, <laughs> I mean, we're just getting started and we're just getting finished um, because we're going to take some questions from the audience. Um, see how easy this Maybe there'll was? be something <laughs> hopeful coming out of the audience. This is already hopeful. <laughs> I think fire can be very hopeful. Okay. Um, anyone? It's, first is always most difficult. Um, I'll tell you a little story. Recently, I was in an audience for an event, and um, I'm always doing public events. Sometimes I have very large audiences, um, and you know, you go up and you do your thing. But I was in the audience, and I raised my hand at somebody else's event, and I felt really nervous. <laughs> my heart was pounding. You know, like, what are these people going to think of? Well, you said, <laughs> it's, it's weird. It's absurd. So, who has a question? Get over yourself. <laughs> Anybody? Okay. Over here, uh, a microphone is coming to you. Thank you. Um, I guess I have a question slash statement. Um, you know, it can be, I suppose, difficult talking about all of the issues we're discussing. Culture, you know, people. If, if people are in trouble, then culture is in trouble. And that's something I struggle with as an artist. Um, but I also think that artists make a choice, you know, they 
decide to make aesthetics, to make beauty, to make the work of their lives about something other than, let's say, you know, politics or, or, or you know, the ugliness that goes on. And I, I just wonder, is it easier on some level to, to um, memorialize either in museum shows or in writing, you know, this discussion of, uh, you know, journalism and lynching and that kind of thing than it is to take on those same issues but to do it in a way that honors your own aesthetics and your own creativity. And what is the museum's role or what is the museum's responsibility in acknowledging that artists don't all deal with the difficulties of the day in the same way? And right. don't we have a responsibility in some sense to, to honor that as a, as a community, as a cultural practice? Well, that's a question for you guys, so... Well, a, a number of artist friends who work in ways that are not representational, not political, not socially oriented, have just shared with me that they have an anxiety, like, is this what I'm supposed to be doing in the face of this reality? And um, each one has worked it out in certain ways. Some people have changed, some people have uh, um, decided that like, and you notice know, some days when the tsunami of the news media gets so crazy, and I try to do the thing where I don't let the outside world in until I've done some intention setting for the day, until I've actually like gotten up, said like what I want to try to accomplish today is this, before I start reading crazy news. Um, everyone makes that negotiation for themselves of how to keep going in the face of all the natural disasters political disasters and social disasters going on? I'm not sure I'm gonna answer the question um, because I always think about responsibility as an as a interesting word, but um, you know, the Brooklyn Museum, just one of the oldest museums in the country, was founded not to, I'm not gonna get into a big history lesson here, but it was, not, it was not founded to show off the great generosity and the great taste of its founders. It was a part of the very early American project in a city, an independent city, then Brooklyn, um, that had many new immigrants, people from all over the place, and the idea is that if we shared their literature, their art, their, their history with one another, we would um, understand one another better, we'd be better citizens, and we'd be able to construct a better society. The point being that social responsibility, empathy, um, civics, were a part of the DNA of this institution. So for me, I think that we have already a lot of art galleries and museums that are very good at showing things from a formal point of view or a biographical point of view. I'm interested um, largely in the social history. And so since I've been at the museum for about two years, you notice a lot of the messaging, you know, yes, we did a Georgia O'Keeffe show with her clothing, but it was a story of self-determination. Um, again and again, we're doing exhibitions um, highlighting uh, the stories of others that have been left out, that deserve to be in the canon, that must be in the canon. So for me, I feel very strongly about our social responsibility as an institution. I think there's a real open thing in the field um, that, that we can play a role in. And I also think that you know, once I get through these first years and stabilize the institution, that there's an opportunity to really rethink how a museum functions in society, much like how many libraries have rethought, they're not just repositories for books, they're now community centers, they're it's job centers, stuff. they're pipelines for opportunity, they're information gathering, they're community. So I think the museum has an opportunity, for example, you know, we do a lot of public programming on mass incarceration. What if we were actually to affect real change around mass incarceration? What would that look like? I do not have an answer, but these are the questions that we're starting to ask ourselves. If we really care about community vibrancy and vitality, what are we doing to support community vibrancy and vitality in the neighborhoods that surround the museum? So there are, I think, a lot of good questions that we should be asking ourselves, and that's, we have a responsibility to do that. Thank you, Anne. I mean, thinking about it, the, the work of the museum, it, I found myself thinking about it more and more recently because of this petition that got made to the Met yeah. about the Baltus. Um, but 
you know sort of like all the outrage and all the noise around it. Ignore the noise. But what's, at the, what's interesting to me at the heart of it is the typical response of a big museum to, to act as if certain things are beneath their consideration. Well, we, we, we're about art, you know. Um, to take on a pose of a kind of permanence that, and so it's always interesting to me what sort of things an institution acts as though are not under, are not available for negotiation. What makes something permanent, you know? What makes something obviously great, you know? Um, what kind of institutional memory do you find not open to negotiation? So the way you've talked about the Brooklyn Museum, I think it's for sure, it doesn't, doesn't mean that you go chasing every outrage and you, you alter yourself every day in response to fashion, but nothing is permanent right. and, and nothing ends up in a museum with a certain wall text um, absent of uh, material conditions that got it there. So I think that is part of the work uh, these days. Um, I'm not gonna museum explain to you guys, but you know, <laughs> just say it. Mm -hmm. I like that you just made up a new word. <laughs> museum explaining. All right, Jordan, do you have anything to say to that? I don't think so. I, it felt kind of generative of institutions, but in terms of my own personal practice and setting intentions, I just, I get tired of holding that weight every day sometimes too and making things for myself. So baking is my way to like creatively, baking? yes, I love nice. to bake, like creatively exhaust that positive energy and sharing and it, it holds a different intention, but an equally important one for me personally. So um, I think in each of our practices as artists and you're speaking as an artist yourself, um, it's just as important to do the work that is self-protective and nurturing, you know? My mom always tells me, go slow to go fast. It's like, you have yeah. to turn in. And every time there have been, um, I haven't necessarily protested something. There's a difference between symbols and substance. Yeah. Um, and that's something my grandfather used to say to her as a young child, as she threw her Angela Davis stickers on the fridge and was like, had a huge afro and he was like, all right, baby, like you can do that, but not only does it matter what's on your head, but it matters what's in your head, um, that it's really important that you're doing the work internally first in whatever capacity you feel is right, you know, that that feels like a constant reminder for me. I can mean, I just say there is that thing in this moment where people are like, show your work. Yeah, what are yeah. you doing? It's like, what are you, and it's and like, okay, like, no, or I'm protesting. Yeah. Like, I haven't been able, I have physical um, challenges that make it hard for me to be present at protests. And although that is a space that I want to be a part of, in my heart, in my body, I can't. So how do I find other ways that that's, that's, a, sim that's a moment where my mom reminds me that those symbols are important, you know, we need them. But you also do substantive work every day when you wake up and look in the mirror and say, I'm gonna go into the world and like offer it something, whatever it is mm. today, you know? And there's not one way to participate. No. There's not one way that's more meaningful than another. Protest is one thing, building bridges is another, and individual, personal, everyday actions matter. And I just wanted to say that it's really wonderful when you meet an artist whose work you love and then you hear them speak and you love them even more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what? Oh, no, no one hates me. <laughs> She on the cover of Freeze. Oh. Okay, one more question and uh, we'll wrap it up. Okay, that gentleman, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the uh, you know, wonderful panel. However, um, coming to this lecture or the conversation, I was expecting that we will be talking about the future of the culture as maybe I understand. Because I think the world, the word culture has been de, uh, uh, degraded. We talk about gun culture or, viol or culture of violence or political culture, food culture, anything. But the culture, the way I understand and I was brought up with 
was something that gives us uh, another layer in our life. We have to have food on the table, we have to go to work, we have to go send kids to school, but that's not culture, that's our necessities. And then we have culture that comes on top of that, the music, classical music, pop music, uh, paintings, poetry. Um, that's my understanding of culture. So coming to, the, um, to this conversation, I thought we would be discussing whether there is a future of that kind of culture in the, in the you know, Americas, whether the Miami uh, Basel will be better next year or will be worse next year, and where Art Basel Miami will be in 10 years. You know, I am, if we go and I see Matisse and I see uh, you know, I see Chagall, and then, and then I go and I see uh, Jean, uh, I see Jean Michel Basquet. And it's still culture that gives me shivers. But I don't need to talk about culture of politics, because I think, or culture of TV, or culture of Hollywood. I want to talk about how, how you guys see the, the future of um, paintings, of artists. And the last comment I want to make about the unity. I live, I live also in, uh, in Houston, and we, three months ago we had horrible flooding. There were no racial tensions. Everybody was helping everybody without any precondition. It was heartwarming that if people are left alone, they will find a way how to help each, each, each other. Everything else is, I think, stirred up by uh, groups that, that thrive on stirring up. Thank you. Well, um, I mean, I think we should recognize the kind of complexity that's inevitable when you have a word like culture. And then when you talk about culture being in big trouble and then you put on a layer of the Americas, it just becomes, um, so maybe this is the first hour of a five hour conversation and then the, the rest goes elsewhere. Just wanted to say two things about paintings, though. Um, one is that Jordan's got a big show next year in Denver. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is... So in its own small and significant way, that says something about our culture, that this painter is going to have a museum show at a certain scale and she's working towards that, and we're gonna support it in a particular way. Um, that Bill has things planned from artists you've not heard of, but who is gonna be part of our conversations, that Anne has things planned from artists you've not heard of, that you should have heard of, gonna be part of, whether it's painting, installation, sculpture, performance, all of that. So maybe that's cause for hope that while things are being gutted, um, the society the, can still sustain a career such as this one that is creating essential work and somehow we're able to prop this up and say we need this, this is important. But flip to the other side, let me talk about half a billion dollars which is about how much was paid for the Leonardo painting and the news has emerged now that in fact it was bought by uh, Mohammed bin uh, Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's culture. You know, he bought it through an intermediary, another prince, um, and it's gonna sh then he's going to loan it to Abu Dhabi for a minute. Um, so what does that mean, that culture? I mean, 
Is that great news? You know, they're busy waging a war that's causing the largest humanitarian catastrophe that's ongoing right now in Yemen. But you know, he's bought a Leonardo and he's, maybe it's a Leonardo. Okay, so all, the reason for saying all of this is that when, the moment we raise a subject like this, it's always gonna be complex. Um, and it's never gonna be able to account for the kind of personal joy you have when you stand in front of a Matisse or a de Kooning or a Kerry James Marshall or whatever. Um, so um, we were never gonna be able to answer the question, it turns out. Yeah. And, and I would never venture to guess what the future looks like in terms of artistic practice, but what we do know is that the idea of culture is much more expansive than what we see at Art Basel. So people will still be making paintings, photographers will still be you know, taking pictures, sculptors will still be sculpting, but even just the whole way that people have hybrid practices that connect with fashion, music, um, brands, collaborations with brands, um, we cannot hold on to a very narrow definition of culture. It's exploding, and I hope that's good for society. Thank you, Anne. I think we're going to stop there. Thank you all very much. So it's so brief. And Pasternak, Brooklyn Museum, Bill Arning, Contemporary Art Museum of Houston, and Jordan Castile, Professor at Rutgers, and independent painter. All right. I'm Ted Cole. Thank you all very much.